This episode of Live WPTV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. How many, uh, how many <laughs> folks here are new to... How many times is this your first address, right? Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Um, how many people have electricity? <laughs> <laughs> You're lucky. You don't? I do not. Um, Pay the bills. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah, you can tell. So uh, usually we have, I have slides, uh, I don't tonight. Um, for the past three years, we've had pizza. If you didn't get the memo, we no longer have funding for that for Microsoft. So there's no pizza tonight. Hopefully you did not come here expecting to eat dinner. We are looking for sponsors and all kinds of things. Um, we hope to restore the pizza service soon. Definitely donate. Go to bostonwp.org. Um, does anyone need help connecting to Wi-Fi? So the network is Cambridge, and the password is WP1031. And that also, so I'm James Coletti. Um, Kurt Eng is the other organizer. He's not here tonight due to the power issue. So um, without further ado, hand it over to Alan for his presentation on 10 must-do steps in converting to WordPress. Oh, actually, sorry, one quick thing. Um, so we're doing a beginner's class. It's going to be November 5th, um, from 9 o'clock a.m. to 1 p.m. Everything you need to know about uh, WordPress for beginners. Um, it's in the Abington Senior Center in Abington, Mass. And uh, there's a sign-up sheet here. There's a discount, um, $10 off for the class. We'll be up here for after. Hi, everybody. All right, so before I get started, I'd like to get a show of hands. <laughs> I have two of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's, good. Um, that's wonderful. Uh, so I will say, I, I uh, like games uh, without power since about uh, 3 o'clock in the morning. And I decided I can deal with the cold. I can deal with cold water. I can deal with not being able to blow dry my hair. I cannot live without Wi-Fi. It's just it's cruel, cruel. Okay, so uh, this was a presentation, by the way, that I, I gave uh, this summer at WordCamp. I don't know if anybody came to that. Uh, I know one person who, two people. Okay, so free. That's great. So, um, uh, and, and Bill told me that my slides and uh, I guess the video is, is up. Um, on the WordCamp site, so we can get to it and we'll tell you the link. Um, a little bit of an update on some of these slides, so um, I'll tell you where to you know, take notes, but um, it's all been filmed and it's there afterwards, so you can um, take a look at it. And Bill's going to keep me honest because if I like, tell you different things than I told you before, he'll tell me what, what I said in the summer. But the, the whole point of this is really to um, help people figure out ways that they can move sites over to WordPress. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about can probably also apply to other um, other platforms, Drupal or, or Joomla, but we're not here because of those platforms. But um, many of these things are going to be um, generic and be able to move on. Uh, we all know why WordPress is a great platform. Um, and so getting beyond that, you know, let's talk about what are the things that you need to do um, regardless of the platform. Um, we can talk about how important it is to review your current assets, what you have. Prioritizing is very important because um, depending on the, the extent of your, your current site, um, this could be a very large project. Uh, and, you know, you shouldn't really underestimate how much time and uh, how difficult it can be. But there's ways that you can make your life a lot easier going. Um, SEO is very important, and, and uh, if you've got good link juice, you want to continue that moving forward. So I'll talk about a number of different things that you can do to uh, make sure you bring that over. Um, back-end versus front-end considerations are very important. What's it going to look like versus what the whole back-end. We'll talk about that. Staying organized, um, keeping really, really good notes, um, I have found is, is vital because you're going to do this probably in stages, and you always want to go back and refer to some things that you might have done earlier. Um, 
you're going to hear me harping on this, um, and, and it, it comes from great experience, I can tell you. If you don't back up your work and back it up, you know, three, four, 16 times, uh, it's going to bite you. Um, and so um, it, it's, it's a mantra, you know. And, uh, there are many different ways you can do it. There, there's easy ways you can do it, but please, uh, has anybody ever, is it just me in this room that's gotten bit before by not backing up work? Okay. Only two? Come on. Be <laughs> you know, how many of us have, have um, lost? It's just that I'm in the middle of a restore. You're in the middle of a restore, right? Yeah. Right now. Yeah. So, like, that's yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, then, how important it is. Okay. So, the other thing also uh, we're going to cover is, you know, your timeline cost considerations. What's easy? What's going to be moderately dis uh, difficult? What's really going to, you know, the things that are going to give you agita? Um, and, and the last is probably the most important of these, and I'm going to save it to the end to say what that is. But um, so, again, uh, jumping right in, uh, WordPress is a terrific platform. It just keeps getting better and better and better with every version. Uh, you'll have people, it's interesting, I went to Drupal Camp this summer, and uh, I talked to a couple of people who were absolute diehard Drupal loyalists, and I said, you know, what do you think the difference is between Drupal and WordPress? And, and I, it was almost like this was the, the, the company line, because I heard it verbatim from six different people. And they said, well, if you're going to do a blog, <laughs> WordPress is a really good place for you to be. Yeah? And, I think they, you know, I listen. I, I like Drupal. I mean, there's there's reason why you'd want to use it. Um, if you if you want to spend twice as much money and you want it to take three times as long, you know, Drupal is a great place for you to pay. And no, seriously, it has a it has a terrific um, uh, a purpose. But they have their head in the sand if, if they're thinking that the content management system that's behind WordPress is not robust enough to handle most needs, and it really is. Um, I, I like to think that I'm platform agnostic, um, and I think that's important going into a project. You know, you should be taking a look at, you know, what is it you want to try to accomplish with your goals, and then kind of decide what's the right platform for you. WordPress is just terrific for for all of these reasons, and and uh, um, uh, I just I just love it. All right, so what's very important starting out the project is reviewing what you have. And there's many different ways that you can do it, but you really want to take inventory of what your current site is. Um, what are your articles? What kind of images do you have? Graphics, videos, documents? I mean, do you even know this? Um, and, and actually, I should probably just seriously take a, take a show of hands here. How, how many people have what they would call you know, small personal sites? How many in the room are, are looking to convert that over? So maybe a third. How many have like a medium-sized site that if you're one or two, three or four, okay. What's medium? Um, what's medium? Um, up to say uh, 500 pages. And then over a thousand pages. Okay. A couple there. Okay. So good. So, so you know, you, you have... Will you address, if you're, if you're blogging on another platform right now, Absolutely, yes, and, and in fact, this is this is um, probably going to cover more of bringing it over from another site. Um, so certainly, but you really want to take an inventory and, and take a you know however you like to take notes, whether it's with a large legal pad or with a whole bunch of stickies or or, or you know on the computer in an Excel spreadsheet. You know, create an inventory so that you know what you have. Because once you start to bring stuff over, I can promise you, you're going to lose stuff, or you're going to forget about stuff. And so it's just it's a really, really good way for you to review what's there. It's also a great way for you to, to start to consider what you really want to bring over. We'll talk about that in a couple minutes. But you know, I've listed out here the many different things. You know, WordPress essentially there's two types of files. You've got you have your content database, um, which contain which holds all of your your text and and all of your images and all of the stuff that, that your visitors are going to see. And then you have your files, which is all the code and the plugins and the templates and the widgets and, and your licenses and stuff that, that 
really is not front end stuff that, that's visible to the world, but, but you need it and you need to know what you have. If you bought anything and you have got licenses that you paid for already, keep track of that because you don't want to have to pay for things again. Um, and, and keep separate lists of, of links. You know, you've worked hard maybe over years or, or, or maybe you haven't worked at it, but you've just all of a sudden you, you kind of you have them on your site. You want to, there's a number of tools that you can use to go in and, and again take get that inventory of what you got going. Google settings. You know how many times? You know I'm guilty of this myself. You know I, I set things up. I've got the you know the password and remembers, and then I go and I'm like, oh, what was the password for? You know, it's easy to forget that stuff. So, you know, when you're going into the project, start to make a record of all those things that you have. Um, passwords, user accounts, very important. Come on in. Come on in. That's all right. That we we have plenty of room actually on the side of the room. Plenty of seats. Excellent. All right, great. Excuse me. Um, everybody has already gone through and introduced themselves. So would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I'm late. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julie Turner from Bedford Center. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Nice to meet you. Come on in, have a seat. Okay. That's great. So um, I recently went through a, a migration uh, myself on my own site, and uh, that's that's the old site, kind of like narrow, has a lot in there, a lot of information. Um, it served me well for like four years, and I built it up in Dreamweaver, and um, you know there, were, there was stuff there that I just, I changed so many years ago that I couldn't even remember what was there. But it gave me a really good opportunity as a starting place to go in and say, what is it that I really want to accomplish now? There were some things that I wanted to bring forward and continue with. There were some things that I just didn't care about anymore. And there were other things that I really wanted to emphasize. So um, uh, building out the new site, you know, I went for a, a wider look. I went for a different design. I, I like the, um, the header that I had, particularly because it was in Flash which is interesting. I, actually, I built my sites as living laboratories, so I purposely wanted to use a little bit of Flash. I didn't want the whole website in Flash because when I did my the mobile version of it, I needed to be able to show that you could deal with having Flash but being able to display it on iOS as well. And, and I did, looked at my site on, a, on an iPad. Um, this, this is actually, you can't see it from the slide here, but, but that's... Um, there's some animation that goes on. If you go to my website, alanbergstein.com, you'll see an animated picture. If you go to my site on iOS, through your phone or through a tablet, it's a static image. So I've been able to get away with that. But my point is, if you go in and you start to think about what you want to do with your new site, going from old to new, you start to realize, oh, wait a minute, you know what? Four years ago, I really didn't give any consideration at all to needing to be displayed on mobile devices. But obviously, today, that's a critical consideration. And so you start to go through and start to annotate all the things that you want to do and you want to accomplish. So um, the new site's on uh, WordPress with um, using Headway, which I love, by the way. Um, and I, I say that because earlier this year, I gave a presentation on different platforms, and I actually took the the thesis side, and somebody else gave a very nice demonstration of all the uh, capabilities of Headway, and, and I have to say they, they turned me on to something that was great. Again, all the different themes have different, they've got pros and cons, um, but I, I love developing them in, in, in Headway and on WordPress. Um, all right, so, so the third area that's very important, goals and priorities. Um, I can't underscore enough how important it is to manage scope creep. Anybody been bit by scope creep? <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have. Um, it, it's um, uh, it's so easy for you to build your new site and never get a launch because you're always tinkering. So it's very important to really understand what is it you're trying to accomplish. Um, uh, what's the conversion process that you're going to go through? You know, um, we're going to cover some of that going on, but but you know, make a deliberate, write it down. You know, put it in front of you for the the two or three months or, or, or year that it's going to take you to, to do this. 
Um, understand who owns the content decisions. Now, if it's your own personal site, um, you may own all the decisions, or your spouse may own the decisions. You know, I mean, it's, it's easy for you to kind of figure out who's there. But if you're in a in a company where you've got different departments, anybody you know have you know different pages that well, somebody in marketing really owns that, or somebody in engineering owns that, or somebody or the, well, the, the boss's daughter owns that. You know, you, you have to to kind of know these things going forward, where you're going to be able to turn to to get decisions made. And before you start changing things, you know, if you have to get permission, um, best to identify that up front. Um, what needs to get moved? Does everything? If you've got, you know, a, a site that's six, seven, eight years old, and you've got, you know, a thousand pages or more on it, do you really need to bring everything over? Um, make those decisions. In some cases, the answer may be yes. In some, the answer is definitely no. You know. That's, so decide on that. What can get archived? You know, certainly there could be lots of reasons why you want to keep things accessible in some ways. Sometimes the access is really just for yourself or some other people within the company. It doesn't necessarily need to be immediately accessible by, by your customers or any other visitors. Um, what parts of your current site can stay in place now? Is it important to bring everything over? Do you need to get everything done in two months? Um, there's ways that you can do this in a hybrid. I'm going to show you one site that I'm working on right now where we've um, we, we brought over pieces of it and other pieces we've left up in place. Um, so it gave us an, a, an ability to do a more rapid launch. What's the transition time frame? Again, an important thing. Are you Is this something that you need to get up and running in, in uh, six weeks and in three months? You know, is this something that you just want to get done before the springtime. I mean, you know, it's important to kind of make a stake on it. This is a lot, these can be very large projects, and you really can sink a lot of time into it. Um, they could take over your life if you let them. On the other hand, they could also drag on for an eternity. So, uh, again, write it down. What do you want to accomplish, and when do you want to accomplish it by? What's the staging production plan? Um, how many people work on in, in, in a sandbox development area? How many people know what a sandbox development area? Okay, all right. So maybe half a dozen of you. So can I assume then that the rest of you basically work on live sites? You make a change as live right there. There's no like staging area. I would advise everybody to consider building your site in such a way that you really can create a development area, which is not public. You know, you can do all sorts of things to it. You can let you know, give certain permissions for certain people to come in and view it. If, if it's a colleague of yours that you want to take a look at, you know what you're doing on a couple of pages, or if it's a cousin of yours, or or if it's just yourself, um, work in a playground area, work in a sandbox, and and get all of your things set the way you want them and then move it up to a live area. I mean, you, you could actually set up many different different um, levels of, of staging as well, but minimally, I would, I would encourage all of you to go for at least two. And um, you'll be able to proofread, you'll be able to find many of the different things that you want to do before it's just so public for the world to see. Another very important reason to do that is, you know, that once you go live, I mean, every Anything you put out there is permanent on the web today. So even though you might make a change, take it down, you know, with, with the, you know, Google's hundreds of thousands of servers, once you're up there, you're up there. And, you know, if there's things that, that are going to be wrong, you may as well see that in a more private setting before you, you take a lot. And what's your testing plan? How many of you have done any kind of testing at all on your current sites? And so that's about half that's good. And, and um, when you did some testing, I mean, did you learn some things? You learned a couple things that you had to change, right? I mean, there's you, maybe you learned a lot of things about it. Maybe So testing is very important. And testing does not have to be complicated. We had a nice presentation. Oh, sorry, one of the other user groups had a nice presentation by uh, uh, Stephen Krug, who's written a great book called Don't Make Me Think. Um, and um, uh, he's got, if you just uh, Google him, 
KRUG. Um, he's got lots of videos where he's given his presentation, but he just makes really, really common sense points and talks about usability testing in small little bites, and, and, and it's easy for all of us to do it. Because you'll be amazed. Yes, sir? Can I just ask a quick question regarding the staging area? Yes. The function in WordPress where it allows you to, you know, deselect the ability or to select that Google cannot spider the site? It's a privacy setting, yes. Does that really work? I hope so, because, God, I've been using it for years. Yeah. <laughs> well, just, I'm counting loaded to work. Can't yeah. you just use that? And then yeah, I, that's one of the, I, honestly, whenever I, I put up a new WordPress installation, that's the first button that yeah. I press. Okay. And, and, and if, if you didn't hear the question, he was asking about the, the privacy control, and, and there's a way for you to tell Google not to spider your site. You can do it also by adding some additional code, but the easiest way is just to go into the WordPress dashboard, the settings, Go down to privacy, and there's just a little check mark option on that um, that says, you know, don't uh, don't spider. And, and by the way, don't forget one of your action steps when you're ready to go live is to, to decheck that. One thing on top of that, there's a plugin called Restricted Site Access that builds on top of that and allows you to put IP-based restrictions or oh. logging restrictions on a staging site. And it's really great if you're setting up staging in development environments. Yep. You can give your clients the, the URL to the WP login for your site, and they can get into it if they can get directly to that. But anyone who's just visiting the development site, will you can either specify that they be redirected to the production site, they be redirected to the login URL, or you can also just show them a message saying this is a development site and you shouldn't be here. And great. What's the name of that plugin? Restricted Site Access. It's uh, done by Jay Goldman at Tenno. So restricted site access. And it builds literally on top yeah. of the privacy pane within WordPress, it just has a few additional options. Terrific. Okay. Also, yeah, as far as I'm aware, um, the, the, what it does to block only works for pages that haven't already been indexed. So if you decide that you didn't do it a few weeks later and you enable that, oh. it's only for new pages that have already been indexed. Uh, that one too late. So again, that's why I make it a, a habit and I really am religious about this, that, that as soon as I put that fresh WordPress site up there, that's the very, very first button that I'm going to I'm enable it, because like I said, you can come back afterwards if you actually Google really doesn't know about it. Um, thank you for that. So um, content considerations. You know, what are you working with right now? Are you working in a, in a content management system that's well-formed, that's structured, that's serialized data? If so, that's going to be very easy to bring over. Um, if it's random, if you just, you know, you've over the years sort of put some data up this way or that way or done a lot of work in Dreamweaver or some other types of, of web building um, software and you're really working with a lot of static pages, um, you just need to know that there's, there's ways to bring it over, but it's going to be um, uh, just different, a little bit more complex. Um, your links. Um, what are we dealing with there? Are, do you have a lot of hardwired links where, again, it goes to a static page, or are you working with dynamic? Is it a news type site where there's a lot of dynamic? Do you have a question mark in the middle of your of your URL that typically means it's dynamic in some way? Um, what are your paths? Are they absolute or are they reference? These are important things to know. Um, if you're dealing with um, news, you know. There's things called server-side includes that you have to just be aware of and move up. Are you dealing with a lot of articles that have excerpts in them, and you want to make sure that those come over? Um, how many different items of content are you dealing with? Um, what's the taxonomy? Are you, are you bringing over your current taxonomy? Do you even have a taxonomy? So again, these in your inventory of what you've got on your site, just be mindful of all these things. Start to make note of it because you're going to make some decisions about how you're going to do this based on what you have. Some more content consideration. If you have a lot of pages, you can get into some um, HTML parser tools. There's an, there's an excellent one um, that's called uh, HTML2. Dot, it's actually 2.1 at this point. Um, that's called HTML2.0 um, import. Uh, you go to sillybean.net and find it. And Stephanie Leary is really um, a wonderful expert. She's got a lot of links to some 
um, tutorials that she's done on this. And again, if you have a lot of pages that you want to bring over, you can experiment with this. Um, it's not um, the easiest stuff in the world to, to deal with. Um, if you know a little bit about coding, you know a little bit about, about how data is structured, you can actually bring a lot of your content forward and, and start to layer it into um, either pages or, or into posts. Um, and she's well documented. So uh, if you look at it, you can save a lot of time. If, if it can also take you a lot of time, and, and that's where you have to start to make that decision. There may be easier ways for you to do it, which are more manual than automatic. Um, you could and, and search, replace, and update. In other words, you, you can um, well uh, uh, copying and pasting is one way that you can bring stuff over, also, and, and in some cases that might be easier than just trying to bring your entire database over in one fell swoop. So, like, what does that parser conversion tool? Does it create pages inside WordPress or pages or file pages? Well, it'll create pages that, that uh, will go right into WordPress, into your post. So it could take, you could take a, um, uh, one of the projects that I'm doing for, uh, I think I have a slide coming up on it. Uh, we actually took a lot of pages, like uh, many hundreds of their pages, that were all formatted similarly. They weren't in a content management system, but all of the pages had a headline, a subhead, the body copy, an image, we were able to then parse that out and have things go into the right places within the database tables uh, that, that WordPress uses. Oh, okay. um, and you have to, the, the, the real critical thing there with um, using her tool is you just have to be able to identify some sort of unique code, a string, that says, you know, the body starts here and the body ends there. The headline is identified this way. It could be H tags. Um, if you are, if that data that you have now are structured, um, that could be your best way of doing it. And then it can then go in and say, all right, if, if it's if you see an H7, you know whatever it may be, then until you see the end H7, the ending tag, pull that content out and put it here, and it doesn't matter. If you're doing 20 or 30 or 50 pages, it may not be worth having to set that up. If you're doing hundreds. It, it could be. She's told me that she's actually converted entire universities and, and using her, her tool and, and done it like in two hours. So, uh, uh, and after having talked to her, I, I believe her. It would take me a lot more than two hours to do that, I can promise you. Um, another very important part of this in, in the context consideration is, is the searching, replacing, and updating every single URL. Because um, you want the URLs to, to now refer to your pages that are, on, that are on a different site. So you can use various different plugin tools. One that I found that I like a lot is called Search Replace Database. Um, and it makes it easy for you to go in and, and find uh, things like the name of your, of your domain that you're currently using and put in a new do domain if that's what you're doing. If the direction you're going, you can have a new domain name. Um, you could do a database export if, if you have an existing WordPress site and you're just going to um, do a new WordPress site. WordPress has a nice import export feature built into it that will make it very easy for you to do. Um, my advice is always start with a small task. And you know, if that's working or if you can get that going a little bit, then start to, to um, scale that up. Uh, but don't try to do your entire site in one fell swoop. You're going to have more to, than you can handle on that. And uh, yeah, I know I've always, okay, I, I've always found that I have to to build time in to do some sort of content scrubbing. Uh, uh, recently, I was working with a large, uh, a medium-sized magazine, and we brought a lot of we were bringing content from the print magazine that had been um, digitized, uh, but had never been posted online to the online site. And so uh, we did a lot of these things that I'm telling you about, but we also had to spend time cleaning up certain headlines, certain characters came over. Um, there's just, there's always stuff to do, because no, you're gonna, it's not gonna absolutely be pristine uh, every single time you bring something over. Question back there, please. Yes, with the import export, um, 
that only within WordPress, or will it also work with other blogging platforms? Well, uh, the question is the import-export, is it only within WordPress? Um, if you're using a blogging platform that has, uh, this, that's built on MySQL, um, you probably will have some pretty good success of finding there's some sort of an export that can translate it uh, and then move it over. Um, if, if it's on a different kind of, with a different database tool, um, the best thing to do is, is Google it. You'll probably find it. I think if you look at the actual WordPress conversion, um, you'll find that it has some choices. Are you bringing it over from WordPress? Are you bringing it over from, from Blogger or from, uh, and I think they, they do, people have, have faced this before and they've written the translation tools. And again, WordPress is why I love it. It just keeps getting better, you know, with every rev. So uh, here's a, this is an, an ad agency here in Massachusetts, Legend Inc. They do great work, by the way. They're a Marblehead, and um, they had a site. Their site is primarily directed at um, at their clients. Um, they got a site that that was 15 years old, um, uh, thousands and thousands of pages of content, uh, to all different types of content. Um, all different types of page templates we're dealing with, um, and, and it's just, it, it is amassed over time, you know, because um, the person who runs the site basically, you know, anytime you got a new idea, would just design another page and another, you know, that, that was purposeful for that page and, and do a lot of the stuff on Dreamweaver and just static. Um, so that's what we're dealing with and trying to convert them. <coughs> Going forward, building it out, we use WordPress with Headway, and, um, uh, it's, it's much better organized, we're, we're migrating into the content management system, but we're, we're taking this hybrid migrat uh, migration approach where what we're doing is we're converting sections of the site over time. We're not doing all, a lot of the site still, it looks like it's all within the same, but in fact the links really are to the old pages and, and as we get some extra time, will then bring over you know, another section and, and work on the conversion. So it, it enabled us to get out there in front of it in, in a matter of weeks, as opposed to if we had tried to take on the entire project and migrate the entire site at once, we would work on it for you know, six months or a year because a lot of this we're doing in spare time. It's, it's probably not an unusual thing for people to just be able to sit down and work on it, but. I'm just trying to emphasize, you don't have to think you have to move the entire site over all at once. Uh, you can very effectively do it in pieces. So typical methods for moving content, well, um, copy and paste works pretty well many, many times. And remember when you're pasting, um, you want to paste clean text in, so if you're using the visual editor, you know that little icon that's got either W for word or the T for text? Use them. Because you're going to find often if you're, if you're just copying from one site, you're going to bring in funky stuff. It's just there on the copy. So, so clean it up. Use this as a, as a time where you can move over and clean. Um, using RSS. You, you'd think that would be a good approach for being able to migrate a site. And you think you're bringing everything, but in fact you may be leaving an awful lot behind. And so an RSS migration can be limited. Um, import and export uh, scripts, whether for HTML or XML, th those are going to be good. And again, they're particularly good if you are going from WordPress to WordPress or you're using you know, like the, the WordPress from Blogger um, because people have already done those scripts and they're up there and they're tested and they can work well. Or the third-party HTML parsers like the one that I mentioned before from Stephanie Leary. She, by the way, authored a very, very good book that was recently released, um, Beginning WordPress 3. And uh, that's, I promise I'll give a little bit of a plug. Because she really is very, very good, very clear. Um, this is her tool. Oh, this is, no, I'm sorry. This is what you would uh, see if you use the, um, uh, the built-in tool. And... Um, WordPress, as you would expect, is very clear. Instructions, just a couple of radio buttons to hit, and um, you can easily export from your old site, and then, here we go, import into your new site, and you can see here the different scripts that are available, Blogger, Blog Roll, et cetera, 
movable type, you know, so you can easily import stuff in. And uh, my advice to you um, is just again start with start with a couple of small pages and, and bring it over. If it's going to work on you know three or four or ten pages, then you can have more confidence to then bring over more uh, at another time. Um, question: If yes. the original site was hacked in WordPress, if the original site was, was had been hacked, had been hacked, and you exported and imported to another site. Are you risking anything by doing that? What do well, you get at? yeah. I mean, I think that you've got various different security issues you have to consider. Um, if you've been hacked, you know, it really depends on the nature of your site. But you know, you may have to go in and literally scrub every single page. You may go in randomly and test different pages. I mean, if it's, uh, if it's a corporate site, that's, that's probably pretty serious, and you've got to. You've got to attack it in a different way than if it was just, you know, some personal opinion site where somebody might have gotten in and, and done something on a couple of pages. Um, yeah. Good luck. Yes, sir. We talk a little bit about RSS in terms of time. Some RSS feeds may go back a certain amount of time. What's your experience? Do they go back to the beginning of a blog or only go back, you know, 20 posts? Well, I, I think there too. You've got to. You can set up your RSS, and you can use you know a couple of applications there to better define how much you want to bring and how far back you want to go. Um, with the standard WordPress one, um, I, I, I don't recall offhand what the limits are. It is limited, but that's why I say I think you're going to. Pardon me. By default, WordPress will show your last ten posts in a feed, but right. there is an option you can increase that to as much as. So if you wanted to use the RSS feed as a way to export, under settings there's a reading page. And in there, there is an option for how many posts to show in the RSS feed. So if you knew that your site had 1,000 posts or 5,000 posts, you could really put that up there. It, James is looking at it. It's going to be turned into quite the query to yeah, do that. Yeah. But you, within reason, could increase that so that you can get all of your posts into the feed and use the RSS importer. But again, it depends because you will hit a limit at some point depending on your hosting environment and things. If you had 10,000 posts and wanted to put them all into an RSS feed, odds are really low that you'll be able to get all 10,000 in there because you're going to hit some server limit on whatever your host is. But if, yeah, if, if, if you were working on that kind of a, you know, you were looking at anything that's really 500 you know, pages or 500 items or more, I, I would look seriously at seven, seven years approach because I think you'll be, um, if, if it's, you're probably bringing over structured um, content anyway, and it'll be easier for you to just bring in um, a large quantity. I don't, I don't think she's literally hit limits on it. Um, so. um, all right, fourth L, L, SEO considerations. Um, anybody care about this stuff? SEO? Yeah. It, it's, if, if you're not writing your site to be found, it's not likely to get found. Um, that's a very, very important thing. So um, you need to decide, you know, are you changing your domain name? If you, and, and there may be some very, very good reasons why you are. Um, if you are, that's going to have a profound effect on your ability to be found with existing your current content. So. Um, by all means, do that, but just know that you have to make certain decisions ahead of time. And you probably need to do certain things, maybe even six months in advance of, of when you really want to go live with something. Um, not the least of which is you know, buying the domain name. Uh, don't wait until you're thinking about doing this, because first of all, you what you'd like to get may not even be available. Second, with any SEO considerations, you know, Google really likes sites that are, are established. So uh, something that, that's you know, been out for a couple of weeks or a couple of months is going to have less priority in their rating than something that maybe you've been established for nine months or a year. So um, the minute you start thinking about doing a new site that would have a new name, you know, spend the seven ninety nine. Buy that name. Just get it. Park it for a little while until you need it. But, but start to make different things. Are you changing your your URL structures? Um, if your site is 
is you know three, four years or older, chances are um, you're not going to want to go forward with that same kind of structure. You're going to want to use um, a structure that might have you know the headline plus the date in it. Well, the minute you change the structure, you're, you, if you have people that are hard linked to the old URL, um, you got to you now you got to tell all of your linking sites that they have to change their hardwired link. That's a difficult thing if you have a lot of them. If you've got, you know, 10, all right, you call the people who have it, say, you know, send the emails, got new them, but if, if, if your site's just out there and you've been linked to by many different, hopefully, you know, you've got hundreds or thousands of links coming into you, getting those changed is a difficult thing. So you need to do things like 301 redirects or whatever you can do, you need to be aware of what you're dealing with. Um, so that's why I say you've got to assess what you currently have and what are your valuable links. Just having a great number of them may not be important, but assessing which of the thousand that you have, you know, maybe there's 20 that are critically important. You'll need to do certain things with those to get them to change the link over to your new structure. For yes, sir. I'm wondering, does anyone know if Google frowns upon 301s after a certain amount of time? Well, no, they shouldn't because a 301 is a permanent redirect, and um, that's very, very common. Matt cuts. But what I'm saying is maybe I'm using the wrong code. If you did change all your URLs and you had a thousand sites up there that were linking to you to different very hard-coded pages, but then you just told it if it hits a 404 to go to your index page, can't do on the yeah. server side. I wonder if Google chops that link on that other side after a while. If you're using, um, uh, I'm just wondering if they, yeah, if they see all these, you know, hard coded links going to an index page of a site, if it calculates that over time, if they catch on. I think the best way that I can answer that is Google will give the most credit to a hardwired link that's direct, that's, yeah. that's pristine. Any variation from that, you're likely to lose a little bit of juice. 301s should be pretty good. You should you should probably plan and you're going to get 90 to 100% credit for what you had using a 301 redirect. Anything less than that, um, or any other device less than that, is going to get, in some cases, substantially less credit and, and pass through. So, once again, I, I'm just my advice here for everybody is just go in, take your inventory, take a look at it. What are the links that you know are vital to your site to bring over the most link juice that you have? Do extraordinary efforts for those because that may be a handful, and then the rest you can handle in a different way. Good. So, on top of this, really you talked about taking inventory of your posts and all of your previous content. So WordPress Core has built into it something called a canonical redirect. Mm -hmm. So if you have a portion of a URL, so you say you've moved your whole site over from some other CMS to WordPress, and somebody copies and pastes a URL, or part, like part of it's right, but part of it's wrong, instead of 404 ing and spitting out an error and saying, you know what, this is totally wrong, you've got, you, you missed a letter, you missed a name, you missed a word, WordPress will actually go through your pages and see what matches partially, and then try to serve up the best page if there's a match. So there are pieces of it where you can say, you know what, I moved over a post, the title might have been wrong, or maybe maybe you copied and pasted it wrong, so you missed the last couple of letters. Mm -hmm. WordPress will find it and then serve up the correct page. And it'll automatically do a 301. So you'll get all that juice for you kind of for free. So you is can that an automatic thing? Yeah, it, it, all, it automatically wow. happens with WordPress course. Right. So you sort of just get that on the fly. Because right. it's the problem that a lot of people have, right? You move some stuff over and the title's not correct, sure. or something is a little bit off, or you've just copied and pasted it wrong, because that happens all the time, too. So you, you yeah. know, on top of being like wanting to be careful, you don't have to be perfect all the time. That's so it's so, some leniency built in. So I think you know, your advice is well heeded to you know read up on this. Um, there's lots of work. There's lots of stuff in the WordPress codex. Just Google it. You're going to learn a lot. Um, but SEO, I mean, work hard for that because it's going to have a big payoff. There's a nice little um, plugin that I use called Simple 301 Redirects, um, and I discovered this after doing my new site. I had changed the structure. There were some pages that um, I, I just I renamed. 
because again, looking at what I wanted to be today, it didn't make sense to name them the way that in the convention they were before. And what I discovered was that, oh my God, I had I had people who actually had bookmarked those pages and they were going to four four. They were going to dead. So I, I was able to using this and go in and, and say, all right, what were the important pages from the old site that I didn't bring over, but if somebody clicked on that, I want to redirect them to a different page on the new site. And this tool lets you create a very nice, simple map. So lots, lots of ways to, to handle that problem. Um, let's see. Uh, again, your user comments. You know, do you have um, do you have uh, to bring all, all those over? If you do, that's another you know, area within the database that you've got to be concerned about, otherwise you're likely to lose them. Um, web analytics, also very, very important. When you're doing a project, particularly if you're doing this uh, for a company, you know, you're gonna spend all this time, effort, energy, money to create the new site. You wanna benchmark it in some way. So make sure that you know, you're running some analytics on your current site and try to use the same code, the same analytics. So you may have urchin code from, you know, five, six years ago and, and you probably know Google bought urchin three years ago, so the code still works. But you, you may be better off in your new site, you're gonna, you're gonna put in um, asynchronous Google, asynchronous code that goes in a different place. You, you may wanna, for three or four months, take that, the new code and plug it into the old site so you have a more realistic apples to apples comparison on what the new site is really doing for you. Um, it's worthwhile considering that, your analytics. Uh, and also I find with analytics too, is make printouts of some of your charts that you might have or some of the stats now and just stick them in a file. At some point you're gonna have, to, you wanna compare it. And I, I found that if you don't make those printouts and put them away, you know, trying to get back to that data, you may have lost it forever, you know. So there's nothing easier than just getting print and you know, stick it in a little folder and put it away for six months. Uh, all right, so back in consideration, special functionality that was built into the old site that may or not, may or not, may or may not port over. Uh, again, this goes to that inventory sheet that I suggest that you create so you know what's there and what you need to worry about creating. If something was done and you had some software that was written to achieve a special function, um, don't assume that that software is gonna be available to you, you know, even if there was a WordPress version of it, that it's gonna be current. So know what you need and, and you know, think about that ahead of time. Your databases, I'm not talking about the MySQL database of text, but I'm talking about do you have member databases, do you have authors, customers, e-commerce, market data, you know, all of your specialized databases that go into a robust site, you know, how are you going to bring those over? Will they display properly within, within uh, WordPress? Um, considering um, the linking structure again, um, what kind of a path are you dealing with? Um, and uh, uh, ads, does anybody have, have advertisements on your site? And um, not necessarily just the Google ads, but ads that you're selling. So if that's the case, you know, are you gonna now make changes? Um, do you need to consider things like, are the ad sizes going to be different in your new site? Um, what about your traffic stats? Again, that goes to, you know, make sure you're, you're taking snapshots, you're, you're printing out right now from your, your traffic reports what you have, because you wanna be able to demonstrate to your advertisers that moving over to the new site, you've now, you know, increased your traffic uh, exponentially, and it's a much better deal for them. Um, so, you know, keep all of that, be thoughtful about that. Tracking codes, as well as I mentioned before, um, you are gonna wanna move up to the Google asynchronous code, it goes in a different place. The, the, the old Google code or the urgent code, when at the foot of the, of the page, it goes much closer, right above the body, and so you're likely to get tracked um, and get more credit earlier on. Um, but um, just plan for it, it's, it's different code. And you, you can get it very easily, it's free from Google. But just learn a little bit about that. Front end considerations, 
your design, thinking ahead. You know, what is it that you want this to do for you? What is it you want to look like? Um, you know, give good thought to that. You don't want to necessarily just take the same design from your old site and just put it on to on top of WordPress. Maybe you do, but you know, there may be this is a good time for you to be deliberate about what you want this looking like going ahead. Um, how many people look at sites on a mobile device? Well, let, let me ask the question a different way. How many people in this room don't look at sites on a mobile device? Two, three, four of you. And I promise you, that's going to change this year. I mean, it, it's, it's important to understand, even though you may be developing on this wonderful 27-inch, you know, iMac large screen and it looks glorious, you also got to be able to read that thing on your iPhone or, or, or on your Android, whatever it may be. And if you're not giving consideration to what that's going to display like on that mobile device, you're really you're not taking your website seriously. Um, that's only going to, it's only going to increase at, uh, at, at a very very. I mean, what, how many iPhone fours were sold in the first weekend? Was it four million? How many iPads? were sold in the first week in millions. I mean, this is, we're not even at the, the holiday season yet. Um, get with it, realize, and, and uh, look at that. Yes. Can I add something to that? Please. So the, you know how WordPress comes with like default themes? Mm -hmm. So the default theme for 2011 is responsive. So if you have an iPhone or an iPad, the theme itself will actually reshape itself to fit the device that you're viewing it from. So there are, there are themes out there now, not just 2011, but other WordPress themes that you don't, you don't even really have to consider that. Right. It just sort of does that for you. On the right. The, the, the designers have already built in the mobile templates inside, and it knows it's got the if-then statements in the code that if, if it senses that it's coming from some sort of a mobile device, it switches over to the other theme. But don't take it for granted. And and I know when, I, um, when I'm building a site, I, I look at it under at least six to eight different um, experiences in different environments um, because I'm always looking at it on different screen sizes. I've got you know, the large screen, I've got my, my um, uh, laptop screen, I've got the iPad, an iPhone, I throw it up on Windows so I'm looking at it on, on Internet Explorer, uh, Internet Explorer <laughs> you know, 9. And so I used to have here before I did this. It's true, especially with Internet Explorer because you look at you, you you look at it under nine and it looks great. You go to seven and it's like, oh my god, what? You know, and it could just be well, one pixel different that throws a whole thing. Well, you know, right? We've done this. And yes, don't forget six. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know what? I, uh, I will say this: since WordPress said we could forget six, you could probably safely. But but you know, but you're right. There's still a lot of people that don't know. It doesn't cost them anything to upgrade to the next version. So you do have to be considerate of all of the different... You can't predict what your visitors are using. That's the important thing. You don't know what kind of a computer they're using. You don't know what kind of a screen they're using. You don't know what the operating system is. You don't know what the browser or the browser version is. You don't know what font set they have. You don't even know what really what, what kind of connectivity they're going to have. And so you have to look at your your site and look at your new site and consider in a number of different environments. All right, the navigation traffic patterns, also very important to consider now, where do we want to move people into? Every page should be deliberate. The landing pages, you know, a call to action. You want, you want to build a site so that you're helping somebody to move through your site the way that you would like them to, not just to sort of have them land on something Maybe move forward, maybe, maybe not. Um, and, and please remember that with websites, um, the front door is not necessarily where your traffic is going to come into. And, and, and I would probably suggest to you that the front door is not where you want most of your traffic to come into. You want them to come into very specific places within your site. So you should be mindful of that as you start to migrate. Where do you want them to go? Do your usability testings and run, as we talked about, it, the, the baseline analytics. Um, stay organized. Uh, again, create a task list, uh, long list. However you like to be organized, you know, do this. Um, you're going to just find it's going to be a lot easier for you if, if you if you start to understand what you need to do with it. Annotate things. Keep good notes. Every step you take, every change, 
every problem that you you solve, you know, you may come back to it. You may find that you know when you Google something, you you may be doing something, and and three months later still be working on this and have to go back to something that you solved, and it's like, you know, oh, how did I do that? But if you if you do and you at least make some notes about it, it'll it'll help you. Um, don't be afraid to print out instructions, you know, and, and, and write up on it. You know, and there's these great, you know, tech support sites or, or the WordPress Codex or, or many other places. And, you know, I'm, I'm often writing various different things and I put big red check marks when, you know, when they're done or circle it because I come back to it. I stick it all to the file and I come back and I go through to make sure that I've, I've accomplished everything or if I've found there's a problem and I'm coming back to that a couple of months later. I'll get that done, rather than you know have it just you know, go into my memory and go right out. Um, anybody use Evernote? You know, if you don't use Evernote, you know, I think this is one of these treats I'm going to give you tonight. You know, the trick or treats, and and it's free. Um, it's great, and a great way for you to just you know put stuff down and keep it you know for each project and just put your notes down. Um, but if you don't like that approach, you know, there's the stickies, there's Notepad Plus, you got, you know, the old-fashioned Spiral Notebook, Task Pro, Basecamp, Redmine, project management tools, you know, I mean, it's just, there's all different ways that you can do this. But the bottom line is do something to stay organized and come back to it. Um, backup, 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 and backup again. Um, download the site as you're starting, take your current site, Use tools like Site Sucker. Download the entire site. Put it somewhere. Put it someplace safe. You know, create another copy that's up on the hosting server. I, I can promise you, at some point you're going to say, "Oops." At some point you're going to need to redo. At some point you're going to say, "I don't like what I did. I want to come back to what was there." Um, it doesn't cost you anything really to make backups and keep copies. I, I can promise you, it's going to save you a whole bunch of time and a whole bunch of, of heartache. Uh, so please do it. Um, and, and remember, you got to back up the database as well as the files. Don't just assume that when you're doing the backup that's within WordPress, you know, that you got everything. Because you might find, well, that, that gives me all my posts and all my pages, but I don't have my, my templates. I don't have my widgets. I don't have the structure. Um, I, I use uh, a hosting service called HostMonster. I highly recommend them. Um, they've got a free backup um, uh, software on their site, and they also have them for, for like 10 bucks a year. You go to the pro version, which gives you a whole bunch of added functionality. Spend the 10 bucks, do it. It's, it's great. Yes. Um, to back up your WordPress installation, I think you need to back up your doc root directory and your var live MySQL directory, and then you're good. Yeah, basically you've got those two those two areas. But again, use tools that make it make it idiot proof for you. They do things automatically, and then you can get into and, and if you need to get into a, a, a particular file, you can bring out just that one particular file. Backup Pro allows you to go in. Yeah, on I mean, individual basis. Core, you really only need WP Content Folder. Unless you've made core modifications, there's no need to grab WP Includes and WP Admin. Really, everything you should have ought to be in WP Contents. Right. The only thing that you'll have in those files that are important are you often have your passwords or, or various other things. So, right. so again, it doesn't cost you any more to back up everything. And the amount of time it takes. Perfect. Vault Press. Vault Press is it, it yeah. is excellent because it runs as a plugin, it's integrated, and it's automatic, and you really don't have to. Yes. I can't speak high enough about Vault Press. Really. Great. Vault is E-A-U-L-T. Vault Press. Yeah. Vault Press. Vault Press. Yeah. Yeah. Vault Press. Don't go to hosting companies. I mean, I'm I, sorry, what's that? I believe my hosting company, I use one and one. Yeah. I believe they, because I lost my SQL database on the shopping cart. Yeah. By accident, they were the whole thing. And then I, I would be surprised if any of the leading hosting companies did not offer. Yeah, they, they got it for me yep. within an hour. Yeah, and, and the way I recommend you choose a hosting company is based on their customer support. Absolutely. Uh, again, that's why I, I happen to love HostMonster. I can, I can pick up the phone within two minutes. I've never had it take more than two minutes. I get to somebody in Utah. Yeah. I get to somebody who's, you know, who, who, you know can speak 
you know, the king's English, if you will. You know, I can understand them, they can understand me. We're solving problems on the spot. It, it works great. And so there are many, many solutions like that, but before you, you know, choose one, I would literally try to call their customer support desk Absolutely. first, because that's going to be where, you know, every other, it's a commodity, right? Every other service, they're all using cPanel now, all that stuff, but it's the support that I think makes the difference. Um, backup buddy, uh, again, a paid service. Um, I, I think very highly of it, probably similar to the Vault Press. So, you know, check it out. Um, uh, they're very, very good, and they, they in particular, have a great set of tools for when you migrate. So you can have your development site, the sandbox set up, and you can migrate to the live site very easily. And that's an important thing you want to want to do too. Yeah, the added advantage that Vault Press has is that you can pay for a higher level of service and has additional security uh, checks and scans and things like that. So if you're working on a site where security and uptime is important, Vault Press is something good to look at because you do get that added level of benefit. And again, it runs, you install the plugin and there literally is no configuration to it, it just does its thing in the background. Yeah. And you don't have to worry that it's being backed up because it ends up, uh, it's the same infrastructure that's behind WordPress.com, so you have that reliability of that, the data, the redundancy, and so on. And you literally, they give you the plugin, you install it, and that's that. That's a beautiful thing. Um, <laughs> Wait, timeliness and cost considerations. And, and you know, are you going to fall into the, the DIY camp where um, you're going to do this all yourself? Um, that's great. I mean, again, you, you can. Uh, many of the sites, um, you, you just need to start to really question yourself. Do you know what you're doing? And what's your opportunity cost? I mean, if this is going to take over your life for the next three months or six months, and you're going to do all that, you know, you forgot to plant a tulip. You know, or you forgot to do other things, or in work, you know, there may be other projects that you could be working on that could be fruitful for you, where you could have turned this over to how many people have a web dev staff or an IT staff that they're just looking for you to give them more projects to do. <laughs> you know, so you've got, if you go that route, you do need to understand, seriously, what other projects do they have queued up? You know, what's, because you're going to get in line with other things and and at some point, somebody's going to prioritize things. So even though you might have been in line, you may get bumped for other things, other projects. So important to understand this. You know, you can outsource. Um, you can go to you know the freelance.com, or you can hire a virtual assistant. You can hire a summer intern. You could you could look for you know a, a child that you might have, or you know a spouse or a friend. I mean, you know, there's a lot of this work. That, that, you know, quite honestly, you hire your neighbors high school kid, and you know they can copy and paste, or they can resize some photos, or there, there's stuff that they can do, and you're paying them, you know, like you would pay a babysitter, and, and, it's, um, and that's fine. You can hire, you can also go to, you know, highly trained professionals, um, you know, who will tell you all the reasons why you shouldn't be doing this yourself at home. You know, it, it's, there's many considerations, the security considerations, you know, uh, are, are paramount. So, you, there's you have to start to decide, and you have to decide this early in your project, what's the route that you're, what route are you going to take? Um, all right, avoiding the heartburn, well, the easy things, starting with a blank slate, you know, and, and um, I, I, I was told a long time ago that there was a reason why God created the world in seven days, in six days, actually, right? And that's because he didn't have, or she didn't have legacy to deal with. <laughs> and if any of you have ever converted over a site, you know, you may have found that bringing over the old stuff is actually the hardest part of the new project. So, um, you know, starting with the blank slate, that's easy. Getting your settings right, that's all the easy stuff. All right, not so easy, but still very manageable, you know, are things like converting some of the structured content in bulk. You've got a thousand pages, you know, they're all structured the same way. They got a headline here, they got the body here, they got an abstract here, you got two images. You know, that's relatively easy to figure out automated ways to bring over. Um, redirects, you know, again, we talked about some of the tools. That's that's still, you know, a, a manageable, very manageable task, an important task, but very manageable. Um, converting sites that use tables as their structure, again, very manageable, doable, 
learn what you want to do, you know, experiment on a couple of pages to make sure it's working, but then you can move stuff over uh, in, in, in a large scale way. The heavy lifting comes when you're trying to strive for full automation. And, and you know, I, I wish I could tell you there's like this one little magical, you know, script that you can, you can buy for, for $9.95 and you press go and, you know, you come back 35 minutes later and your whole site is magically converted. It's not going to happen that way. And the more robust your current site is and the more you want to take your current site to, you know, to really, you know, look out as to what you want to do, the more difficult it is striving for full automation. There's a lot of moving parts. There's going to be a lot of hands and work that has to be done. Converting Flash for mobile OS. You know, again, there's Adobe recently came out with a, a beta of a program that you just take your current Flash and you run it through this filter and, and out comes, <laughs> out comes. So um, it's not as simple as we would love it to be. Maybe a couple of years from now it will be, but right now that's a difficult thing. You need to give some consideration for that because you know, a good part of the world is going to be looking at your site on a mobile device, learn HTML5, learn CSS3, stay away from Flash, unless you want to use, like I'm using it specifically, to show people the problems. I have a, there's a purpose for me to use the Flash, and it's really to demonstrate why you shouldn't be using Flash. <laughs> foreign language, anybody's sites have foreign language pages and, and need translation? Again, that's heavy lifting. That's special consideration that you need to, to give to that. Um, Working inside the database tables, you know, it, it's uh, uh, it, it's this isn't using you know Bento for the Mac. I mean, there's you know you can once you start looking at some of these MySQL tables and needing to change things, um, you have to have a little bit of an expertise, um, or at least six copies that you backed up, <laughs> and and replacing the AMP server system again, I think, is an important thing if you're. If you're an ad-driven site and you're going to move from, from one type of an ad server to another, um, that certainly is heavy lifting. That's, that's your money coming in. You need to give serious consideration to that and talk to the experts there. All right, 10, 10 is possibly the most important must-do, which is you've now done all of this work getting your site from where it was four, five, six years ago, and you've realized how difficult it is. Give some thought to where you might want to take this site two, three years down the road. And, and do stuff now in a, in a structured way. Do stuff now where you're consistent, because it's going to make the changes that you want to do several years from now that much easier. And um, you know, don't go through the same game you're going through now two, three years from now. Learn from that. So future-proofing is, is very important. Um, so it, it couple of slides here for, to summarize. Um, what could go wrong? <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Well, if you back up, you know, and, and you plan for time, that you are going to undo things that you've done, you are going to redo it, you are going to lose, you know, but you have the backup. And um, how many people over the years have made backups and only when you've gone to restore, you realize, oops, you know, for some reason that backup just never really worked properly because you didn't test it. For God's sakes, test out your backup so that you know, you know it's working and you know that it's, it's going to give you what you expect it to. Work in the sandbox, development area first. Um, you know something? On, it doesn't cost you any more. Really, that's the magical thing about a lot of this stuff. It's not like you're doubling your cost. You're not. You know, so, so start to plan out your new sites where you're working in development and then you're going to migrate to live. Right, we'll put three stages in between. Yes. Where would you recommend setting up that sandbox? Well, um, if you're working with a, um, a, a host like HostMonster, um, you can just set up a, 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 a subordinate site. You know, just, it, it's a very, very simple thing. That's you're creating a subdomain. You create a subdomain off your main domain. You don't have to buy and register a new domain name. It's a subdomain. You're going to protect it in, in ways. And um, many of the hosts, like the host monster, you, you could have hundreds of sites up there, and it's not going to cost any more. I think he's going to answer my next I, question. I have, I have a suggestion actually for that: is if, if you can, if you can have a sandbox set up on like a separate server, but you can use your host file and switch the IP, like to what was actually the live site versus what's your sandbox site, 
because the problem you're going to run into is once you start filling up your sandbox with data, if you actually want to use it like a real sandbox, so like a staging server where you're entering posts of you know, 500, 1,000 different pages in there, and you want to export that in and you want to move it into a new site, you're going to, you're going to have a bunch of URLs that you've linked in into your content, and they're all going to be wrong because they're all going to be linked to your sandbox. So you're going to have it in a separate folder or the separate URL that isn't for your actual production site. So if you're, if you're actually going to do it and develop them side by side, you almost want to have your sandbox be hosted, pretend, like at the actual domain, but with a different IP address, and you as a developer use your host file to switch where it lives. Because otherwise, you're just going to run into a bunch of URL machines. But I mean, there, there are different ways you can get around it. You can you know, search for the database. You can do all sorts of different things to try and like, counteract that. But if you can afford to do it right the first time, you're better off having a completely separate development environment. And, and I think the, the main point in here is just put it as to one of those things that you have to think about and you've got to do what's right for your particular project. So like for, for our sandboxes on WordPress.com and our, like all the .org sites, we like have live data. So for any sandbox that we have for like non-production code, we're running with actual live sites that just have extremely awesome backups that we can be going back to if we mess something up. So like there was a, a WordPress core change that went in like the 2.9 like, dev cycle, and it messed up every single option uh, that got switched on WordPress.com, which affected like 30 million blogs. And it took an hour to revert 30 million blog data, all that. That's, so, that's a great point. You ever, how many people here um, have some plugins in their WordPress site? How many people here have like more than a dozen plugins in their WordPress site? Yeah. Right. And so when the plugins come through with revisions, do you just hit update? If you do, let me tell you, you're going to be in trouble at some point. If you work in the development site, you test the new plugin version first. Make sure nothing blows up. Make sure everything's fine. And then go to your live area and update it. And not until you've seen it working and nothing's changed, nothing's broken, Get update on the website. This is a novice question, but does WordPress automatically update with different regs? No, not, you, not yet. You're, you're always offered. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're offered, and, and it's suggested to you. So how, how did those 30 million blogs get? So that was on WordPress.com. So the oh, .com okay. site is the host of service. Oh, so with, okay. with 3.2, WordPress uh, started doing Delta updates. Mm -hmm. If you're not familiar with that, is instead of downloading all of WordPress every single time an update comes through, uh, it'll just uh, download the files that have changed. Mm -hmm. So that's step one into doing like the, the automatic update. Mm -hmm. Kind of like Chrome or like other web browsers you're familiar with where you don't know what version of WordPress you're running anymore. It's sort of the goal, right? So WordPress just sees that there's an update and it just grabs it on its own and updates what it needs to without you ever knowing the difference. So that's the, that's like the, the one year plan for like WordPress core. But, that's, right, but even that's there, they're yet. still gonna always give you the option and give you the notification first. You're gonna press the go button on the update. They're not gonna automatically just update it because yeah, too many things are gonna happen. You never know what's going on. What's that? No, 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 even with the incremental updates. No, 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 he's talking about it. Yeah, like the, like the future goal is to go back to updates itself. That's right. what, what John's alluding to, is that they're, they're moving towards automated right. updates. Well, right. uh, so I, I know I, I, I personally would never enable that on my site. So I would want to make sure that I tested it first. That's the way Facebook yeah. works now. You don't know what version Facebook's on. They just oh. automatically update a Chrome and so much yeah. of this web-based software yeah. now where so it, you know, the version number has kind of been rolling in the sand. Firefox did this a couple of months back now yeah. where they've blown through versions five, six, and seven in the course of three or four but weeks. But you know what those are closed but those are also closed environments. You're not you're not mm -hmm. dealing with sixteen different plugins on a Facebook page that that could go and, but if and the plugins written right. properly then it shouldn't matter. And not not only that is it's that you've got to get plugin yes. developers writing things right. correctly and then WordPress the the reason why this is like a 12 month plan is because WordPress core needs better <coughs> internal like, unit testing to make sure that those kind of things don't break when updates come in. So it isn't that we're just going to start pushing code out and say, well, hope your site's okay. <laughs> it's, it's more along the lines of, well, like, as our internal testing tools get better, then we can work towards that as the ultimate end result. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that WordPress, the reason why WordPress is as popular, in my opinion, as, as it is and why it stayed that way, is because of its 
constant focus on backwards compatibility. There's code in there that we wish that we could refactor, but we can't, right? Because we have to support a bunch of other things that maybe we didn't really make awesome decisions six years ago when we were trying to build out the whole taxonomy structure well. But so be it. You know, we kind of have to make sure that we can improve what we can and leave the stuff in there that we have to leave in. So well, I think that there too, it's, there's things that are going to happen in the future, but right now, if, right, if you're planning your site migration, I, I would understand that it's probably not prudent to just hit the automatic update without you first testing it first. And it doesn't take much to test it. It doesn't take much to build it. So, I mean, if the site's been live for a year, let's say, and it's running wonderfully, and then all of a sudden you see the little thing say, we have an update for WordPress, I mean, do you have to stage it? In a testing area, or like I, I would never, I would never, personally just hit go. hit go. I would do it in my testing environment first, where I have the same. I'm, I'm basically mirroring. I've got the, in my, my my sandbox at this point because I've got the live site. My sandbox has the same plugin versions, and in many cases the same data or at least represented data that, that's there. I would test it first. I would do the update first in in, in development. Take a look at it. Plug RAM in a couple pages, and then do the same thing on the live site. Uh, so, is there something that you can set up that your sandbox constantly mirrors your live site? Well, because I mean, if you've added constant plugins, and automatic. You know, um, I think that I've not necessarily seen it. You could probably run some scripts that do it, but it's not that big of a deal to run something. He has a script. I have a suggestion. Okay. Uh, if you are familiar with uh, version control. You could use something like Git or SVN. So on all of our, on everything on WordPress.com, is just loaded into a big repository of code. And when you update code, instead of just FTPing it up into a file, so or into a server somewhere and hoping that it works, we actually check code in to a repository where anybody else can see it and work off of it. So that on my sandbox is just a checkout of code. And I modify what I'm working on live, and if it's good, and if it works on my sandbox, and I commit it in, and all the other you know, 100 developers at Automatic that are kind of sandboxes too, just pull the code out that I just pushed in. So if, it's, if you're working with multiple developers in an actual development environment, you have to have some kind of version control. So that way you're not... Sandbox. Well, yeah, kind of. Rather than try and keep things in sync and see what happens between the two of them, if you're, if you're actually considering having a sandbox, uh, and there's tons of documentation on how to do this, you would you'd really want to research. Um, or talk to me after, or whatever. You know. Um, because you would really want to do it uh, in, in, a, in a version control kind of way. I, I learned this the hard day, by the way, the day that I broke the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I did a, a change on, on a live site. And you and Al Gore, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have another question. So I have, like, lots of my count of 17 WordPress sites. I just love the fact that you're raising your hook. <laughs> <laughs> it's a disability. <laughs> 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 when I need to upgrade a plugin, should I have 17 different sandboxes and test the plugin on each one and then deploy it 17 times? Uh, potentially, yes, and I'll tell you the reason why. You've got, if you have 17 different sites, if they're going to be um, similar sites, first of all, you, you probably can, can start to move to um, the multi user version of WordPress, it would probably make sense for you to do that, in which case you're doing something once and then pushing it. It basically calls it in, uh, from whatever site you're working on. If they are 17 different sites and you have a different set of plugins for each site, that's where the problem can come in. You have, you have plugins written by all different people, and that plugin could have a, 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 a negative interaction with another plugin. So it affects site A, but but since plugin B is not used on site C, you know, just upgrading it there works. So, because what I've been doing is before I upgrade anything major, I just make backups and I deploy it to the live site. And if something does break, I just roll it back. Well, okay. So I, that's, I don't so I don't have what I consider to be mission critical websites. And, and that's an important consideration, right? If if, if it doesn't matter, if something's broken on a site for several hours. If that doesn't matter, then you can get away with that. So every site, everybody here is going to have a different set of considerations. And really what I'm just trying to give you is like a whole bunch of stuff that you could be thought, uh, thinking of because it may pertain to you or it may not pertain to you. There's no one way to do it. And, and it really does depend on what your particular situation and, and, and 
my guess is you probably have a whole you know, range of those sites, you know, that some are much more robust and, and sophisticated than others. And uh, you get away with it one place, but not in another. In the back of the room? Um, I actually just want to support what you've been saying for the past like, 10 minutes. I've had a situation where, like, uh, about two years ago, we, uh, I think uh, the website was made before I got there. I think they purchased, like, a theme or whatnot. And uh, another colleague updated the WordPress to the latest version, and it completely crashed the entire site. Yeah. And we kind of learned the hard way. But yeah. another um, workaround is um, what I actually do is whenever I install plugins or whatnot, I um, install a XAMPP on my computer, and I just use a local server. And I kind of, if I, if I was testing it on, like, let's say, WordPress, version 2.9, I would just get that latest version and install that plugin, and I would import everything, obviously, and I would just taste, test it on my local server and then upload it. Because there's, I, I, think, yeah. I think everybody here is getting the sense that, that there's many things, there's many moving parts, many things can go wrong, and they will go wrong. So do things in a way where you can test it out first and make sure that you're getting the result you're looking for, and then move it up to where the world is looking at it. Um, you know, Murphy has it. The most important person who's going to be looking at your site is going to look on the day that you have that one glitch, right? So, so do something about it. So um, well, one last thing. I know yeah. I keep interrupting. That's none of your great points you're doing. So you work for WordPress, by the way? I work for Automatic, yes. Oh, well, we do. So something that we've looked at for WordPress core is being able to actual, like, actually sandbox plugin updates or theme updates. So when like plugin updates come through and you click update, that before we actually pull that code in and run it live, just push it out on your site, is we actually will pull that code into like a temporary folder, run it in place of it, and run it like in an output buffer to see if it actually dies or not. And then if it does, not actually push that update out. So hopefully in the future, like we know this is a problem, right? Because not all plugin authors like, make sure that their code works all the time and they don't make sure that it's compatible with their plugins or themes. So like this is a known issue. Or if you update something and it's something else is out of whack, you have white screens, you could have a bunch of errors, your whole website can go down and you'll be like, well, why did that happen? I did set updates, so I told them, you, we want you to trust that as much as you want to trust it too. So it's a known issue, right? But we're, we're looking at ways to improve that too, so. So that hopefully, while, while it is a problem, hopefully it won't always be. Uh, just a couple of the quick things to, to um, just to, to run through here, because I'm, I'm mindful of the time now, but, um, Stay organized. Talk about purge what's old and not needed. You don't need to bring everything over. You know, maybe you do, but you probably don't. So this is a really, really good time for you to edit and decide what's important going forward. Um, stay organized. These are complex undertakings in many cases. Um, structure your content for the future. Use the 301 redirects as we talked about to maintain the linkages. Give yourself time. Give yourself resources. It is going to take you more time than you think to do it. Um, communicate, communicate out to people, communicate to your teams, communicate up to you know the, the people that are funding this, uh, communicate down, communicate to your spouse, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to come home <laughs> next month, you know, whatever it is, talk about this, put it down, put it in writing, get it out to people, talk to your readers, let them know what's going on. Um, talk to your advertisers, the woman who had the advertiser, I think she's, she's gone, but, but if you do have other stakeholders, and you do have people that are paying money on this, you know, get them involved in some of this up front. Benchmark it, audit it, test it, poke at it, um, resist scope creep. You are going to find that all through this process, you're going to learn new things and new things that you want to do, and you're never going to get your site up and running. You know, stage it out. Figure out what you really need to go live with, when you want to go live, get close to that deadline, get that going, and then work other things in as, you know, phases down the road. You know, you can always do a V2 of your site or a V2.3. Um, and um, uh, read the tutorials, you know, ask plenty of questions, outsource what you may not be great at. You know, do the things that you want, do the things that you love doing. When you get to that point that's really going to make it very difficult for you, figure out a way to outsource that part. It'll make the whole process much easier for you. You know, the folks at Automatic WordPress have done a great job of documenting this stuff. They've got great user forums. Um, go there, use it. Um, by the way, this is a list, you know, uh, a long list of, of the plugins that I use for site conversions. 
this is all going to be up, well, it is up on, on uh, if you go to where this demo is. I'm also going to put this on, on my website, so you'll be able to go to a couple of days. When I get my my back, when I get some power back, <laughs> this will be up there. But I, I have found um, that these plugins really, really help me in many different aspects of site conversion. And my web dev toolbox, my personal toolbox, um, it's remarkable how much stuff that you can really get for free or low, you know, low, low cost. Um, and uh, but these are the different tools that I, I regularly use. And um, you've all got your favorites. There are some of these that I, I can close my eyes and use. There are some that every time I go to what I have to, you know, refresh myself on it because I don't use them that often. But they're very, very useful, and they range from, you know, things like Firebug um, or a variety of different platforms to, to Dropbox. Anybody use Dropbox? You know, if you don't, again, that's one of those things where it's, it's free to sign up. You get five point, you know, five gigabytes for free or something. As a matter of fact, if you if you go to that URL that I put in there, we both get an extra uh, two hundred and fifty megabytes for free as a bonus. Um, but is we'll Rant is Rant from the crowd favorite guys that does the the one where you can move sites from one to the other pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't tried it. Is it good? I've been waiting to find somebody that's used yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just, I looked at it and I, I played around with it and it's, for me, I, I just put it in that side of like, this has some potential and I'm, I'm right. waiting to hear somebody who's yeah, like, hey, right. I, I really like it. Um, and, and if they, you know, if the price point was a little lower, I probably would have bought it already. But I, I don't have a lot of personal, I just have hope for that. Um, the hosting service, again, um, I use them. Uh, if, if you go on right now, they have a special deal that's good until midnight. Um, it's not their usual pricing, which is seven ninety five. Uh, if you go to my affiliate link, you get a four ninety five today till midnight. Which <laughs> hour? Three ninety five. Actually, they've got a special Halloween special. But in, in all seriousness, they've got great tutorials. They've got great service support. Um, there, there's a dozen more companies like them that do the same thing, and I would just encourage you. Test the customer support aspect of it before you commit to anything. Um, but these, these guys are great. Um, backup migration, again, um, they've got uh, uh, terrific thing. I, I love backup buddy now. They just made it a lot easier. It used to be like 16 steps that you would go through to migrate a site, and they brought it down to like really realistically about two or three steps. Um, it costs a little bit of money. I think you know, a single site is $75, and, a, and you get a 10 site pack for 100 bucks. Midnight tonight, use the code BOO25, you know, and you get 25% off. Um, whether you use my affiliate link or not, it, it's, it's, I think they're great, and uh, I, would, I would recommend them. You get great help from the WordPress community. I've had, I've had incredible um, uh, success in just getting all sorts of things answered from Thesis. They're, they're developer. They've got a very, very active forum. You can throw a question up there, and within an hour, you know, within a day, usually no more than a day, um, I've got two or three answers, or at least you know some people pointing me in the right direction. Um, Headway is the same; they're getting more and more and better with their support, and the community is. A, I mean, that's what WordPress is all about: community support, and and really, really good. Um, I'll, I'll get to you in a second. Um, WordPress.org, WordPress forums are great. Uh, WP Candy. Um, you know, I love it. They've got incredible tutorials uh, there. That's a, that's a wonderful. Smashy Magazine uh, is terrific. And, and of course, us, right? The, the WordPress user group. Woo! I just wanted to add one thing regarding support. There's a lot of great, you know, theme and template companies out there right now producing some amazing full fledged themes. Yeah. But make sure you look for their support. Yeah, you know, and, and it's a great point. I, I don't have experience with, you know, the vast majority of them. I have experience yeah. with several of them that I'm really happy yeah, with. I would tell you that I would not buy a, I would not buy a theme from anybody until I was able to get access to their community and see what kind of support they A lot of them have instant live support. I mean, I've been up at yeah. 2 in the morning and get someone, boom, like that. And that's what you want. Because when you when you got a problem, you got to solve that problem yeah. in short order. You but then can't. another company was yes. on India time only. Yeah. So I had like a window of four right. hours at like right. two in the morning my time that I could talk. Right. To. And you know what? I mean, I would spend another fifty bucks for a theme if, if that support is going to be instant because it's, it's that's 
and well worth it. Yeah. Um, great tutorials. Again, I'll put this list up with all these links. You know, great tutorials on, on the content migration. Uh, I've added a couple on here in terms of some SEO stuff that you need to know. But um, uh, it's uh, it's there's a lot of information out there. Get smart on it um, because uh, if you make a decision one way or the other, it really can have a profound impact on your ability to bring over a lot of the people or move over most of your site very easily. And thank you. How are you? But um, I was just curious. I've been trying to, I've been looking to do designing a theme using Dreamweaver, and the books I found don't seem to mention Dreamweaver, and I'm just wondering if you know any of the resources for designing themes with Dreamweaver. Books, I, I've read a uh, number of articles about that. I, I think if you were to Google Dreamweaver for WordPress, or Dreamweaver on WordPress, or Dreamweaver Cotton WordPress, you'll get all sorts of people making comments on that. There are um, I think w, WP2, as a tutorials, did a series on uh, on just that, and um, Smashy Magazine probably has that, but I, I found that I've also decided I, I don't want to go that route. I just found that it's, there, there's some things that I now use Dreamweaver before to go in and do, but I don't necessarily use that now to uh, develop the site on because the other software that's available and the other themes, frameworks, um, just make it so easy. They really do. I'm actually, I had to, I had to dust off Dreamweaver recently because I'm doing some sites now so, um, in, in Facebook and I'm using Dreamweaver for those pages. Um, but I, I still, I still need to go elsewhere for WordPress. So is there a better way to make them <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't make my own thing from scratch. I mean, we, we actually had a session uh, this early part of the summer, I think, right, about about the different approaches you can make. And and, um, and James actually is an expert in uh, some of the frameworks where you can uh, go in and really do a lot of the coding. If you're so inclined that way, um, there's all sorts of ways. If you're more visually oriented, I, I, I'm much more visually oriented. I'd rather use a framework that's already been built Headway's um, great for that, um, and, and their new version of, that it's in beta now, 3.0, um, I'm just blown away by it. You know, you're starting off with a blank slate and you're just building it from there. And to me it's like, you know, it's like almost designing a website using the same kind of approach you might use if you were doing things on InDesign or in one PowerPoint. You know? That's what I want. Well, That's Headway.com? Yeah, Headway. Headway 2.0 was really nice, and Headway 3.0, which is in beta, which is probably going to, by the end of the year, come out with. It's super. All right, great, thanks. Over here? Any questions? Yes, from a, I mean, I'm sure you've dealt with a lot of clients. Do you get a lot of pushback from clients that have existing, well-established HTML sites? that don't want to switch over because they're definitely afraid their SEO is going to drop. But sure. They, if they are. Sure, and, and, and rightly so. That should be, you know, I, I've done whole-scale, large uh, newspaper sites where, you know, that was our, our, our uh, number one thing. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've learned the hard way. I've been delisted from Google. I mean, these are serious considerations, and, and you can lose, you know, uh, many, many nights and weeks of sleep if all of a sudden, you know, you realize that you know something went wrong. You have to plan these things out. The, the more sophisticated the site is, the more problems you're going to have. You really need to understand why do you want to move. What is it you're trying to do? If you have really good goals and you're very clear on that, you want to be able to sell your organization then on all the reasons why you want to do the migration. But it's not just because we want to change some color around or we want to, we're tired of it. You've got to have you know. It's well thought out, well documented. You want to know your strategy, and you need to get buy-in from all the stakeholders in the organization that are going to be involved. Over here, questions? Come on. <laughs> Arr, you must have another question. I have a question. We have another answer. No, I have another question. <laughs> <laughs> you're supposed to have questions. You're supposed to have the answers. No, I don't. I give up on answers. I have questions. 
How many successful migrations have you actually done? Like you personally. Me personally? Yeah. The fine success? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Loosely. <laughs> <laughs> Loosely. Several dozens. I mean, dozens. Yeah. yeah. What was the hardest one that you ever had to do? First one? Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a funny guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a funny guy, yeah. Uh, it, it, um, that was probably the hardest one because um, I, I really didn't, I never went to a presentation like this where people were saying to me, here are all the things that could go wrong and here are the things to consider. Um, I was working with um, a, a fairly large proprietary content management system um, and uh, uh, I was working in a, in a large uh, publishing corporation. I had political things that were going on. I, had, uh, I was told by the chairman of the board, go do whatever we're going to learn from you do, do what is going to be necessary for us to look forward and, and have every other publication follow you, only to discover that I had the IT department that said, well, you know, we would really appreciate it if, you know, and there were many, many reasons why they wanted me to not move to WordPress, but to stay on the proprietary system. And um, I, I, a lot of it made sense. I mean, they really were legitimate reasons. Looking back, I would have said, oh my God, that was my first mistake. I should have just said no, you know, and, and gone off to do it. But um, there were very, very compelling reasons, and, and uh, the content management system could not scale to where we wanted it to go. They couldn't do the conversion. Um, I, I, I really mean I, I had clumps of hair coming out when we were when we were migrating the content. And um, years later, it, it just never got right. Uh, so, so that was probably the most difficult one. And, and I have to tell you, I learned an incredible amount from that. You know, the, the sharing with you and I share with all my clients today many of the, the disasters and, and the awkward moments that can go on from that. So, yes, good. Okay. Well, just build on what you just said. You said it didn't scale. What didn't scale? What should you have been looking for to know that it wasn't going to scale? Is it not going to scale? Yeah, I mean, things like uh, um, looking at it in a mobile site was not easy to do. Um, the um, anytime I needed to do something, I mentioned like in, in Drupal, and I, and I mean this is true. Drupal is, is great, has has one purpose, but my experience with Drupal is it will always be twice as expensive and take three times as long. With the proprietary, and, and that's not necessarily bad. Again, I, I want to be clear. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm not dissing. I really mean this because I think that you know that there's there's great stuff that 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 platform does as well. Um, but this particular. Uh, proprietary content management system, anything that I was going to do would take eight times as long, cost 20 times as much, and because I couldn't even find developers who could develop it. So I, there was one guy in the country, and, and I had to get in his long queue to get something done, even the simple stuff. So, you know, with WordPress, thank God, there's, there's a huge, active, robust community, and there's an awful lot of people who really do know how to make it safe. You guys are probably you know, part of that. You can, you can do great things. A lot of this stuff is like playing an instrument. Anybody here play an instrument of any kind? And you know, anybody play an instrument really, really well? Okay. Well, you, you know, and, and, and I, 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 I play I play drums and I play really, really loud. <laughs> but you know, if you put the time in and you learn it. You can make it do more, whatever the instrument is. You can do marvelous things with it. And, and WordPress is the kind of platform where if you put the time in, you can do amazing things. I, I still, I don't think I've seen a site that I look at that I say, I couldn't build that WordPress. I mean, you could. It's it just, you know, there's nothing that I've, I've really looked at that said, you know, I just, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. It's a pretty nice product. So uh, keep doing great things. Do my best.